The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. Well, the Apostle John would have loved those songs because one thing John is all about is the beauty of Jesus Christ. And we're going to enjoy speaking of that today. Um, well, we've, we've come full circle, haven't we? It's my privilege to bring you, it was, the first message in the book of 1 John and in this series, and now seven weeks later to bring you the final message concluding this magnificent letter by the Apostle John. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the sermons by the men. It's, it's been a really good time. It's been a joy to see how the powerful truths of John's letter have been faithfully declared with a genuine like-mindedness as each portion of this book has been explained and preached. I hope you've seen that. Uh, And this morning, as we finish the book, we're going to see John continue. Right up to the end, he's going to continue to drive home truths he has shared throughout his letter with these dear people. So, let's begin. Uh, We have much to cover. Uh, I, all the men, including myself, know why Ken only does a few verses at a time now. <laughs> this has been a real challenge, but we're going to move quickly. We won't be able to spend a lot of time diving into detailed explanations of each verse, but we do want to get the main points John makes as he concludes his remarks to his little children, the, these dear people that he loves, the aged apostle desiring each one of them to hold on to Christ by faith, to live out a righteous life, and one day become like Him as they enter into His presence and behold Him face to face. That's the goal. That's the goal. So we'll take our text in some sections. Verses 5 through 12 speak about the person of Jesus Christ and God's witness to His Son and the reward for believing in this one 13 gives us the purpose statement of the book of 1 John and sets up the discussion in verses 14 through 17 on prayer. Verses 18 and 19 are a marvelous declaration of the Son's protection of God's children. Verse 20, when we get there, you'll see, is one of the most profound declarations of the person of the Son in all of Scripture, I think. And verse 21 is a pointed command and exhortation to us, so... Let's get moving. Put on your track shoes. <laughs> in verses 5 through 12, John reinforces one of the main themes of his letter as he defends the person and work of Christ. You've seen that, haven't you? This is on the line for him against false teachers and their deadly satanic doctrine which destroys the heart of the gospel. We're going to talk about it. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, did not come in the flesh, He could not have been the sacrificial lamb taking the place of sinners and receiving God's righteous wrath as their substitute sacrifice. Ultimately, we have no gospel if this didn't happen. We have no good news for you if the false teachers were correct. So John is passionate to deal with this error. So we read in 1 John 5, 5, Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And I want you to notice, remember Brian's sermon last week, how verses 1, 4, and 5 tie together three significant truths concerning the new birth, overcoming the world, and believing in the Christ of the gospel, declared from the beginning by the apostles. Verse 1 states that whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is born of God. Verse 4 states that everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, has victory over the world because of their faith. That word, Nike, victory over the world. And verse 5 states rhetorically, that the one who overcomes the world is the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So John makes it crystal clear that the Jesus you must believe in is both Messiah and God the Son. 
Jesus Christ had to come in the flesh to fulfill God's promise to David. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, Your house, your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. He's talking about a human descendant. Jesus Christ had to come in the flesh to accomplish the sin-bearing work of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Only a physical son could bear our sins under God's infinite wrath and be crushed by God in our place. Had to be. The whole Old Testament points to God sending this person, this son, the one who is the lion and the lamb into history to fulfill all his promises and prophecy through this person. But this human son of David sent into the world through Mary is so much more than David's physical son. Angel Gabriel, you remember, told her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. The physical son of David is the Christ of John 1. 1 through 4. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. He's the Christ of John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh. The eternal Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And He is the Christ of 1 John. You remember those great verses at the beginning of this text? John says, what what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested to us. He became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. This is who this person is. So here's the point. Only those whose faith is anchored in this Christ are the ones whose faith overcomes the world because they have truly been born again. So really the question is, are you believing in this Christ this morning? I'm not so naive as to think that there aren't a lot of different ideas out there about who Jesus is. But it doesn't matter what you think. It's only this Christ that's being proclaimed from this book that will save you. That's all there is to it. Are you believing in this Christ this morning? Nothing less. The false teachers of John's day were not proclaiming this Christ. They were proclaiming a heretical, false view of Christ that said he did not come in the flesh as a human being. So in verses 6 through 12, John argues against them, declaring that the Holy Spirit and God the Father witness to the truth that Jesus Christ came in the flesh as a human being. 1 John 5, 6, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. Spirit is the truth. So John says that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, came by water and blood, and that the Holy Spirit, who is the truth, testifies to this reality. Now, there's been a lot written about water and blood, and I'm not going to share it all with you, believe me. It would take a while uh, in terms of what it means. But many commentators agree, and I do too, that water and blood refer to the two events that stand at the beginning and the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, his baptism and his crucifixion. And we'll see why this is the focus for John. The false teachers denied that Christ came in the flesh. They denied that he took to himself a full human nature in order to accomplish God's work on earth. Many think that they were influenced by the heretical teaching of a man named Serinthus, and he was a contemporary of John, and uh, some of the church fathers think John even wrote John in 1 John to combat this man's teaching. And, and, And here's kind of a summary. 
Oh, by the way, don't ever name your kids this, Serenthus. Forget that name. Serenthus distinguished between the man Jesus and the Christ. Let's see if you can follow. He denied the supernatural virgin birth of Jesus, making him the biological son of Joseph and Mary. Man, that's right there, that's it. He portrayed Christ, Christ as a spiritual being that came from heaven and descended upon the man Jesus at his baptism and then used him to accomplish his divine task in the material world, proclaiming the unknown Father and performing miracles. He then left him again before his crucifixion, never to become flesh, remaining spirit untouched, by suffering and pain. That was the view. And, and you're probably sitting there going, what a wacko. Right? That sounds unbelievable. Who would believe that? Well, I kind of agree with you, but let me, let me just ask you, is there anything going around today that's unbelievable about Jesus? I mean, this is pretty, pretty out there. But there's unbelievable things being thought and taught about Jesus Christ today. And some people might read that and go, man, that's it. That's what it is. I believe that. Right? This sounds unbelievable to us. It's no one more unbelievable than what many Americans believe today. Go out and ask somebody on the street, who do you think Jesus Christ is? You're going to get a lot of wacko answers. It's only the one of this book that's going to save you. So we have to get out there and proclaim the truth, don't we? The false teachers were promoting this false view, this heretical view. The man Jesus was flesh and blood, but the heavenly Christ remained a spirit being and was unaffected by Jesus' humanity, only using him to accomplish his will. Now note this, though. John states that Jesus came by water and blood, not with water only, but with water and blood. So many commentators think apparently the false teachers did not have a problem with the heavenly Christ being associated with Jesus at his baptism. In fact, they would attribute the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the heavenly Christ, and they claim to have received this baptism. The things they're sharing, they say, are sourced out of the Spirit. We're giving you truth from the Spirit. So that, that wasn't a problem for them. Here's the problem. The key problem for them, what they truly objected to was the idea that the Christ of heaven could in any way be associated with the sacrificial death of the man Jesus at his crucifixion. Wow. Christ, the Christ, the heavenly Christ, left him and returned to heaven prior to the crucifixion, again, never to become flesh, remaining untouched by such suffering and pain. Do you see how that destroys the gospel? We no longer have a substitute sacrifice for sins that, it, that, that can save us. How can a finite human being appease the infinite wrath of God against you? Can't happen. Can't happen. There is no gospel. And dear people, the enemy is always trying to destroy the truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ, isn't he? Always bad thoughts, wrong thoughts, unbiblical thoughts, trying to undermine the gospel and its authority. That's what he's about. Not only through Serenthus in John's day, but many, many today. He's trying to undermine this glorious message that we take and pray for men to be saved through. He'll never stop doing that, people. Never. Never. So in verses 7 through 10, John develops his argument. Let's read it. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And they are, the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that He, God, has testified concerning His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony. 
that God has given concerning his son. Well, I'm telling you, when you start messing with Jesus Christ, <laughs> you are messing with God and his truth. So what does John do? This is kind of neat. He personifies the two events that stand at the beginning and end of Jesus' earthly ministry and adds to them the Spirit's testimony who stands behind that ministry, okay, uh, to make three witnesses. And I think it's to parallel, you know, the Old Testament idea, the Old Testament idea that among men, anyway, a testimony is confirmed not by one guy, but on the basis of two or three witnesses. So we have this idea whereby... There's this testimony, but it's even, it's even more, we'll see. So, the Holy Spirit who brought about the conception of Jesus in the womb, right, testifies and agrees with the witness of Jesus' earthly ministry, that this ministry, it, that this ministry was performed by God the Son in the flesh, accomplishing all that the Father gave him to do during his ministry, including, including his horrific death on the cross for sinners. And I think when you start talking about this ministry, especially uh, his works are, are that silent witness to who he is. You remember the works Jesus Christ did? His words are powerful. But you, when you think about his works, what a silent witness, but powerful witness to his person and who he is. When you start thinking about that, you have to see that this is, he's more than just a man. You remember Matthew 8, 27, when he stills the storm on the sea with a word that's raging and it's about to drown everybody, and he stands up and says, peace be still. Wow like glass on the water. Matthew 8, 27, the disciples, the men were amazed and said, what kind of a man, what kind of a man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? That's the question you have to answer. Jesus said in John 5, 36, when they're just not believing, he gave different ways in which who he was was confirmed. In 536, he says, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. It's not just the words of John. For the works which the Father has given to me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. These works are witness to who He is in the power of the Spirit. And I think this just nails it. And then John adds that ultimately it is God the Father himself that stands behind the witness of the Spirit and the, and the earthly ministry of Christ, this water and blood idea, the ministry, confirming his person as the God-man. At Jesus' baptism, you remember, here's the beginning and the end of everything. At Jesus' baptism, at the beginning of his ministry, the Father proclaimed from heaven, you remember, Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is the person I promised to send. He's more than just the physical Son of David. It's God the Son taking to Himself that human nature. My beloved Son, the eternal Son. And what happened at the cross in terms of the witness of the Father? When He was being crucified and crushed and killed, we have God's supernatural witness to His Son, Matthew 27, 45, now at the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. Wow, darkness. Matthew 27, 51 and 52, and behold, the veil, when he died, the veil of the temple was torn in two. Who did that? God, the Father. From top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Father bears witness, the beginning of his ministry, the end of his ministry, that this one is God in the flesh, God the Son. And then John says in verse 10, the one who believes has this testimony in himself. What testimony? 
the testimony of God concerning his son within him, confirmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. They believe this with all their heart. It's God's testimony. They've embraced it. They believe, right? And if you do not have, believe this testimony of God concerning his son, John states that you make God a liar. Isn't that amazing? There's so many people out there right now who would never in their wildest imaginations think they're calling God a liar. But they're not believing the testimony, are they? Not believing. If you do not believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man, you make God a liar. Again, are you believing in the Christ of the Bible this morning? Is he your hope and everything to you? I hope so. Verses 11 and 12, John says that God testifies then. If, this is, if your belief is in this person, God then testifies to you who believe in the Son of God that he has given you eternal life. Wow. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. Many of you have probably memorized this verse. It's a great verse, verses. And the testimony is this. That God has given us eternal life. And we want to get our arms around that. It's not just about longevity. It's not, you know, all these movies, you know, you got to drink this, so I want to live forever. Ah, but they're wicked fools. You know, it's not about that. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Well, you have, to, you have to see that eternal life first is in His Son, okay? Second, he who has the Son has life. Does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Here's an implication. Eternal life is not about believing a set of doctrines, Doctrine's important, but you can have them all nailed down and not have eternal life. Eternal life is not about knowing the right people. Going to the right church or belonging to the right family. Some people sitting here think that that's got to get them in. It's rubbing off on me somehow because they go to Southside Bible Church or have godly parents or are in the right crowd of people doing the right things. Okay, That's not eternal life. Eternal life is about trusting in the Son of God. It's about being in the Son. I want you to get this. And it's about having the Son. It's about union with the Son of God. Union with the Son of God by grace through faith. It says, Paul told the Colossians, eternal life is about Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. So I have to ask you, is He yours today? Do you have the Son? Not do you know things about Him, but do you have Him? Are you in Him by faith? Do you have a vital, living, love relationship with God that only comes through union with Jesus Christ? And I'm telling you, union with the One who is eternal life will change your life. That's what this book's all about. When we get to this next verse, we'll see that. Many can say, I'm a Christian. I know the stuff. But they do not have Jesus Christ. Do you have him today? How do you know you have him? And that brings us to verse 13. The purpose statement of the book of 1 John. These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know 
that you have eternal life. Is that an important thing to know? Yes. Yes. Uh, these things refers, I think, to all that John has written and reinforced throughout his letter. These things include, I don't, I'm just kind of summing up, it's not exhaustive, but here they are. First, it's believing in the name of the Son of God. What is a name? What is a name? It's the full beauty of his person, a name, of the Son of God. We've been talking about it. John's been driving it home. You must believe in, have faith, trust in the Christ proclaimed from the beginning by the apostles. You can't drift from that. Who were eyewitnesses to his life, death, and resurrection. And we've stated this before, too. So I don't think it's wrong to state it again. But this is not knowing the truth and even giving hearty approval to the truth. There are people who, are know, who know today and give hearty approval to the truth, but that's not going to save you. Is it? You can know and approve, but you have to lay hold of Christ by saving faith. He has to be everything for you. And if you have this faith, you will also have the second point, the indwelling spirit-empowered obedience to the Word of God out of love for God, the practice of righteousness. If you have Christ, your life's going to reflect this. Remember how John put it? The one who practices righteousness is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. What? is the general tenor of your life. We're not talking perfection, but we're talking practicing righteousness. Do you love righteousness? Is that what you want to characterize your life? Because you love God. And then finally, if you have this faith, John says, you're going to love the brethren. You're going to love your brothers and sisters you're not going to have to work it up. It's just going to flow out of you from within because it's a family, isn't it? It's a family. Blood bought by Christ and brothers and sisters closer than any physical family could make you. So you believe in the name, you have the indwelling spirit empowering you to practice righteousness and you love the brother. And these things I've written so that you may know that you have eternal life. People, if these things are yours, it's because you belong to Him. You're His child and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's the only one. Who is the ultimate source of these things? The Spirit of God is the source of this life. Isn't He? You can't drum it up. You can't impose a bunch of rules on yourself to make it happen. It's got to flow because the Spirit is present in you. And seeing these things in your life, you can have confidence, right? We want, if you have Christ, we want, this confidence is yours. It's yours. You can know you have eternal life because you truly have the Son. You can have this confidence. And as we move on to verses 14 and 15, John kind of connects this confidence of the believer in prayer uh, that's coming up on the assurance of knowing you have that relationship. If you know that, it promotes your prayer life. So let's read verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is amazing. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. So these two verses talk about prayer in general. Then we're going to get to 16 and 17, which talk about prayer for a specific issue. But as God's child, you can have confidence before the Father that if you ask anything, and what's the caveat? What's it say next? According to his will. That's the key. If you can ask anything according to his will. He hears you and will grant the request that you have asked from him. And dear people, the word of God is full 
full of things that you can ask of Him and be confident that He will answer. Just let me, let me give you a few. For example, 1 Thessalonians 4.3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Wow. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Will God answer that prayer for you as you pray for yourself and others? Is that His will? Will He answer? Will He change His people? Will He bring about this conformity to the image of Jesus Christ? Are you praying for that? God's, God will answer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. And everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Are you a thankful person? Pray, pray God will answer. He promises that. He just said he promises to hear you. 1 Peter 2.15, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. And I would go back and t- look at all those texts in their context. Don't, you know, just don't take them out of context. Go read and see how it's related to what God does in the lives of his people. But he will answer these prayers. He will answer these prayers. Now in 16 and 17, John brings up something specific to pray for. This is pretty amazing. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death. Excuse me. That's a good place to stop. Let's just stop. He shall ask of God, he shall ask, and God will for him... Give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. Amen. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. And then he says, kind of sums it up, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. So, in verses 14 and 15 then, we just read John before, John stated... That as God's children, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and will give us what we ask. Now, in verse 16, John gets specific and encourages believers. And we're going to talk about the negative, but I want you to get the positive. Encourages believers to pray for one another in their battle against remaining sin in their lives. That's the key right here. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But let's talk first about the meaning of a sin leading to death. Does that cause you pause? That, you know, we're not, John doesn't say to necessarily pray for that. Does that cause you alarm? This is serious stuff. Most commentators agree that death is not physical death here. This is eternal death. Eternal death, eternal destruction. And I would say this. I think it's reasonable to assume that this is some kind of unique sin because John states with respect to someone committing this unique sin, I do not say that he should make requests for this. So because of John's statement, this must not be the sin that is common to every person born dead in sin into this world in Adam, who are in desperate need of the gospel of the Lamb, whose shed blood redeems lost sinners from the penalty The power and one day the very presence of sin. That's not what John's talking about. In fact, we're commanded to do what? Proclaim the gospel and pray for it to be effective in the hands of the Spirit so that sinners are rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. So that's not what John's talking about. Can't be. So, after doing a bunch of study... It's hard to be dogmatic. This is another one of those, I'm not going to share all that stuff with you, but let me give you my conclusion. It's hard to be dogmatic, but given the battle John is fighting against false teachers, who he, he declares to be antichrist, who were what? What were they doing? Dogmatically promoting heretical teaching about the person of Christ, which destroyed the gospel, in which they claim to be truth sourced out of the very presence of the Holy Spirit within them, I think that they represent those committing a sin leading to death. 
So, here's another thought. John's not super dogmatic on this, but the bottom line is John's comment to not pray for such people is tied directly to what? Their hard-hearted, determined promotion of satanic doctrine, which they say comes from the Spirit. They are false teachers in the most destructive sense of the word. Jude's comment is appropriate here. Jude 12 and 13. These are men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars, get this, for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. couple implications for us. I believe that John camps on this idea of sin leading to death because he cares about his little children. As discussed above, why? He, he wants to drive home the absolute seriousness and eternal consequences of entertaining the idea of even embracing a heretical view of Jesus Christ promoted by false teachers and then following them in their apostasy to wholeheartedly travel down such a path, I think John is saying, leads to unrecoverable eternal destruction in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you get the seriousness of this? And there are false teachers today that are leading people down that path. Here's a second implication, though, that's a little bit closer to home. We may not have anyone here this morning, probably not, um, who falls into the category of the false teachers John so severely condemns and implies that they have placed themselves beyond prayer and recovery place themselves beyond prayer and recovery because of the hardness of their hearts. But we can say that anyone, anyone here who continues to reject the gospel in hard-hearted, stubborn rebellion or self-righteous pride is sealing their eternal doom. If that's true of you, you're sealing your eternal doom. Now I pray Constantly, for many in this situation, knowing that God can save them as we sing from the arms of death in the deepest grave. That's our only hope, isn't it? He can do it. So we pray. But I plead with you. Oh, I plead with you. If you have not humbled yourself and come to the Savior to be delivered from sin and eternal death, that you repent and embrace Him now, now, today. Stop making excuses. Stop thinking that you have time. Stop believing the lie that you can live for this world and still be okay with God. Stop running from God and run into His arms. Today may be your last day on earth, right? You may take your last breath today. Oh, come to Jesus Christ. Uh, dear people, embrace Him by faith as your sin bearer, and receive eternal life from God. Eternal life from God. So, uh, that plea said, let's glean the wonderful positive truth in this verse about praying for one another. I think this is really important. In contrast to the false teachers who are committing a sin leading to death, true believers cannot commit such a sin because of the presence of the Spirit of God within them. Within them. Yet they can Still sin, right? John said that if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. So we still sin. So here John encourages us to pray for one another as we fight against remaining sin, striving for holiness, and a close walk with the Lord. We can be confident that such prayers are in accordance with God's will and will be answered. And I know we're used to praying that for ourselves, because we have sin and it's so obvious to us. But dear people, we're involved in a corporate battle against the enemy. 
And we desperately need each other in this fight, don't we? I need your prayers, and you need my prayers in this battle. God has ordained eternal life for each of His children, hasn't He? At the end of the battle. But He's also ordained the means to that end to include our prayers for one another in this battle we fight together. Isn't that fair? Please, pray for me. Remaining sin is always present. We want to see righteousness, a walk in righteousness. Pray for one another to see this in our lives. God will hear and answer you. I think that's really neat. In verses 18 and 19, John reaffirms the reality that the believer cannot commit a sin leading to death. This is wonderful. This is great. 518, we know that no one who is born of God sins. From previous texts, we know that John means that no one who is born of God practices sin. It's not sinlessness. It's about practicing sin. But he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Man, this is a great claim. This. <laughs> Believe this. The word keeps means to preserve someone or something. And the real issue then is concerning the phrase, he who was born of God. Colin Cruz, a very excellent commentator on 1 John states, the reference here to he who was born of God is best interpreted, and I agree, as a reference to Jesus himself, he who was born of God, the Savior. Right? Remember Jesus' prayer in John 17? He speaks of having kept safe all those whom God had given him, except Judas, son of perdition, and prays not that God will take them out of the world, but that he will protect them from the evil one. It's the Savior who keeps you. And then he says in 519, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. What's the point? When you consider that verse with verse 18, John is highlighting the omnipotent power of our Savior to keep us in a world that lies in the power of the evil one. Who is sovereign over the enemy? Is Jesus sovereign over the enemy? You better believe it. The power of the enemy can't even begin to compare to the infinite power of your Savior. Right? Right? So what does God do with these evil intentions? Why can He not harm you, which means to, to, you know, to, to really genuinely harm you? Why? Because God even uses Him to bring about your good. All things work together for good to those who love God. And your battle against the enemy is being used by God to bring about your good and conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. Anything He does can't hurt you, can't touch you. Isn't that great? Amen? Amen. We're no longer under the control of the evil one because Jesus Christ keeps us safe and he cannot ultimately harm us. We're almost done. <laughs> now, unlike Ken, I'm not going to say that three times. <laughs> I mean it. We're almost done. Okay. As we come to the end of John's letter, verse 20, excuse me, gives us a magnificent, this is a magnificent declaration of Christ's work and person. Listen to this. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. Jesus has come. He's the one who opens eyes so that you can come to know and see and behold and love God Himself. God Himself. You remember John 17, 3? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, Jesus said, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And in Matthew 11, Jesus makes it clear that no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. So He has come. 
and given his people understanding so that they may know God, him who is true. And, John says, not only that, knowing God the Father, but we are in him, the Son who is true. We are in the Son. Like we've been talking about, do you have him? Is he yours? You're in the Son, in his Son, Jesus Christ. Right? And then John says something unbelievable. Explaining who Jesus Christ is. He says, this is the true God and eternal life. The Net Bible makes it clearer from the Greek. This one is the true God and eternal life. It's not vague. John is saying that Jesus Christ is the true God and his eternal life. Right? You remember what he said right at the beginning of the book? Right at the beginning again? The word of life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. He's the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're back. Book ended, right? We're at the end of the book. And it would have been interesting, or I think John could have stopped right there. But there's one more verse. <laughs> I love it. John never stops talking about Christ, exalting Christ. He can't stop proclaiming the beauty of Jesus Christ. So he says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. What is that doing there, John? It was such a... Okay. Why do you think John would end his letter with this sober command? This is a command. I think two reasons. He's saying, don't let anything in this created universe distract you from devotion to Jesus Christ. If anything does, that's an idol, isn't it? Don't let anything come between you and him. Nothing. And secondly, he's saying, don't embrace any Christ that's less than the Christ of this book who has been declared to you. The God-man, fully God, fully man, may he alone be the Christ you embrace. That's what he's saying. Don't depart from embracing him or being distracted from him. May everyone here have Christ by faith and know that they have eternal life. That's my prayer for you. Isn't John a first John a book? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this marvelous letter. We thank you that the, the, uh, about the power that we have been discussing, the power of these words in every way. I pray that you would drive the truths of this book home to every heart seated here. Every person here needs to have Jesus Christ, to have eternal life. So please, Lord, help us to proclaim the truth well here at Southside. Help us to do battle against the enemy's lies and the foolishness that he presents. Help us all together to pray for one another in this battle. And please help us never, ever to take our eyes off the beauty of the infinitely beautiful and lovely one who is God in the flesh, who is eternal life. Dear Lord, bless this congregation. Help us to live well. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.